Our resident commentator on the passing scene is award losing writer QQ. When we call him award losing, that's an understatement. Q has lost more awards in 109 years, more than 1100 paste bins twit longers hashtags and videos, than any other living poker. His video game criticism has appeared for the past four months in the magazine of Downton Dew and Mojitos. And like our commentaries here, is called <coughs> QQ's Watching. Over the past few years, literature of the fantastic has begun to wane in popularity, with many moving to other mediums, such as anime or video games to find such stories. Plenty of reasons for this have been suggested, such as our society's declining literacy or the greater power of the visual medium. But video games have their own form of skill requirements that one needs to play them, similar to reading ability. And literature has its own strengths that visual mediums do not have to balance things out. No, the reason why so many are going to other forms of storytelling instead of books is because of the overall declining quality of them in recent years. Now I know that Theodore Sturgeon's revelation says that 90% of everything is crap, but lately it seems as if 99.9% .9 of everything is crap. When you look at the stories published today, even comparing them with the lesser stories of old, there's a noticeable difference in quality. So today, we're going to show a few factors that might have caused this change, starting with science fiction, the genre of literature whose name sounds like crickets fucking. Now, the most obvious change to the market of sci-fi books is the introduction of the young adult, or YA genre. Sure, there were stories aimed at the teenage audience before, but it wasn't until quite recently that there were dedicated sections in bookstores and libraries for that type of reader, thanks to the later Harry Potter books and the Twilight series. What really brought this change to the sci-fi market, however, was the massive success of The Hunger Games. But the thing about The Hunger Games trilogy, and the many other books that were inspired by it, is that they have less in common with the young adult stories that came before them, and more in common with action movies. It's less like Flowers for Algernon, or even Ender's Game, and more like The Force Awakens. Well, that alone, there's not that much wrong with. Sure, it sucks if your taste in stories leans less towards action movie and book form, but this is just the audience voting with their wallet to dictate what the market should look like. The problem is that certain outside factors have influenced the market in a negative way. It's well known that bookstores will often hide their science fiction books away in a small section of the store that's not easily accessed unless you're specifically looking for it. What this boom in YA sci-fi has done is given publishers a way to sell science fiction novels in the YA section of the bookstore, on the same shelf as the YA books that take place in our modern day. And it should be obvious what sort of impact this has on sales. Why a more cynical mind would suggest that the main reason why many of these books are published as YA is specifically to break out of the science fiction section. The advent of digital books really hasn't changed this much, since digital stores are still sorted by category, and no one's going to click on the science fiction category unless they want to read a science fiction book. Amazon still has a front page to their website, as well as a front page to their book section, and it's going to be influenced not just by your previous shopping history, but also the marketing budget of each individual title. But we'll get to the less than positive influence that Amazon has had over book publishing a little bit later. Let's take a look at the side of science fiction publishing that isn't dedicated to the YA audience. Now, the men and women who acquire books for these publishing houses are called acquisitions editors. And a common theme that we found with some acquisitions editors is that they don't seem all that interested in books themselves. From their posts on social media sites, they're just straight up lacking that passion for the art of literature. Many editors and the major book publishers barely ever talk about books online, and when they do, they're just promoting titles from their own publishing house, likely ones that they themselves acquired. Instead, you're more likely to see them engaging in online political punditry or talking about their favorite television shows. I mean, it's possible that they don't mention the books that they're reading publicly on social media, but it doesn't make any sense that someone who loves books would never mention them while going on and on about the latest show that they've watched on Netflix. I suppose that these editors see their job as just that, a job. But then I have to ask, if you don't love reading, if you don't have a deep admiration for the art of the written word, 
then why the hell are you working for a book publisher? If you spend so much of your free time watching television, then wouldn't a job working in television shows be better suited for you? I mean, hell, with the advent of the internet, it's not like there's any real barriers to starting a show. The success of Felicia Day's The Guild proves as much. But by now, I'm sure plenty of you are saying, but QQ, book publishers are obsolete because you can just self-publish on Amazon now. Well, first, self-publishing with Amazon is an oxymoron since it's not really self-publishing when in reality you're letting Amazon publish your books for you. But beyond that, the situation with Amazon is a lot more complicated than the initial narrative made it seem. Now, it really should be obvious that the idea floating around that one could become as rich as J.K. Rowling by publishing with Amazon was completely unreasonable. So we're gonna take a look at a much more down-to-earth example. The success story given to us to show how much an author can make with Amazon publishing is Mike Cernovich. For those of you who don't know, Mike runs a blog called Danger and Play, among other projects, one of which is a very large Twitter presence. Last year, Mike released Gorilla Mindset, which after six months sold over 16,000 copies, and each copy sold earned between 365 and 690 depending on the format purchased. With those kind of sales, it's easy to say that that book earned Mike a good chunk of clams. But the thing is, Mike's situation is unique to Mike Cernovich. Gorilla Mindset is a health and fitness book, a subgenre of nonfiction, which is the most popular type of book that they publish. So it's not wise to expect those kinds of sales from a science fiction book. Beyond that, Mike already had an audience in place from the free content on his website, podcast, Twitter account, something which other authors don't necessarily have. But we can't talk about self-publishing without mentioning a certain science fiction author called John Scalzi. He's well known for having released his first two books online for free, one of which was bought and published by Tor Books. In gaming circles, he's probably most famous for an article on the video game website Kotaku titled Straight White Male, The Lowest Difficulty Setting. Where the video games? Where, where video? But we'll get to that piece in a bit. We can obviously guess where Scalzi's political leanings lie, but the real question is, are his books any good? Well, Boing Boing certainly seems to think so. Scalzi's Red Shirts, existential comedy space opera. Scalzi's Fuzzy Nation, a masterful, likable reboot of one of the great science fiction classics. Forever War with Better Sex, Starship Troopers Without the Lectures, Old Man's War. Gosh, this Cory Doctorow guy really likes Scalzi's books. He's reviewed quite a number of them, and he often mentions Scalzi in other articles on Boing Boing. Scalzi's books must be pretty good if... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's this? Oh, it's a picture of John Scalzi and Cory Doctorow together? Scalzi says in his blog that his editor at Tor Books, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, introduced them at a science fiction convention, where they became friends. Scalzi, in a later blog post, talks about how his personal friendship with Cory Doctorow helped him start his career. Quote, Cory made a huge difference. Well, I guess it should be pretty obvious why Cory Doctorow had such high praise for John Scalzi's books, given their personal relationship. And I suppose it never occurred to Cory Doctorow that maybe he might be a bit too biased to give an honest recommendation of the books that his friend, John Scalzi, wrote. Okay, now maybe this isn't as much of an issue for readers who are already fans of Scalzi, since he often talks about his friendship with Cory Doctorow on his blog. But the thing is, Scalzi's fans really don't need reviews of his books to know if they want to buy them or not. These reviews are really more for readers who haven't already read his books, people who aren't yet fans of science fiction. As Scalzi himself once said on his blog, quote, I write gateway science fiction, science fiction designed to make the reader want to read more science fiction. So one of the main audiences that Scalzi is hoping to reach with his books would have no way of knowing his less than professional relationship with Cory Doctorow. If they were to read a review for one of Scalzi's books on Boing Boing, they'd just think that Cory Doctorow was really excited for his books. But it goes beyond just an author using personal connections to sell some books. What about the many science fiction authors who aren't friends with someone at Boing Boing? With John Scalzi's huge success, it would seem that there's a pretty big demand for military science fiction novels, so a lot of authors and publishers 
are going to be focusing on that part of the sci-fi market. And this kind of sucks for readers who prefer other types of sci-fi. But even beyond that, the authors writing military sci-fi aren't necessarily going to see the same success that Scalzi had. And not because they aren't as good, I mean, hell, they're probably better than Scalzi, but because they aren't friends with the right people. This means that there are plenty of sci-fi books that you, the reader, won't hear about, because the authors who wrote them are likely more concerned with writing a good book than forming the relationships needed to get the book featured on major blogs. So right after John Scalzi mentioned on his blog that Corey made a huge difference for his career, he then goes to talk about his nomination for the Hugo Award. Oh, I'm sure by now that most of us have heard about the drama surrounding the Hugo Awards, but the funny thing is that all of this could have easily been prevented. Yes, over 20 years ago, Harlan Ellison did a commentary for the Sci-Fi Channel about how, with the sudden popularity of the internet, the Hugo Awards were not nearly as valuable as they once were, that it was now quite easy for an author to get a Hugo by going online and begging their fans to register for Worldcom and nominate them. And just like Harlan predicted, it's not hard to find authors of science fiction doing just that. For several years, John Scalzi would always have a blog post to get readers to nominate work for the ballot. One year, Brandon Sanderson had a post on his blog asking fans to nominate his podcast and a novella that he wrote, even going so far as to give away free copies of the book to anyone who would nominate it. Now isn't it strange that the only time he's ever been nominated was when he was a part of some voting slate. Shannon McGuire did some Hugo begging of her own. When called out for this behavior, she then tried to claim that the people who were upset with her were singling her out for being a woman, even though the posts criticizing her actions were also criticizing plenty of other creators, both men and women, who were doing the same. While authors begging for awards is a big problem with the Hugo nominations, there's also bloggers who beg their readers to nominate other authors for a Hugo, many of whom they just happen to be friends with. The most well-known examples of this are the sad and rabid puppy campaigns. But the thing is, they're far from the only writers organizing voting slates. We found over a dozen Hugo voting slates on various sci-fi blogs across the internet. I'm sure there are plenty more out there that we didn't run into. The narrative that the puppies are solely responsible for ruining the Hugo ballot is a complete fabrication. It's obvious that the main reason the puppies were so successful at sweeping the ballot is because they just happened to have the most popular blogs that were running Hugo slates. I'm sure if BuzzFeed were to publish a post titled, Top 5 BuzzFeed Writers Eligible for the Fan Writer Hugo Award, they could probably sweep that category with a bunch of writers whose only contribution to the world of science fiction is writing top 10 articles of sci-fi movies everyone's already seen. The puppies, they're just being used as a scapegoat to distract people from all the other slates on blogs across the internet. But the narrative that we've seen more recently is that the sad puppies aren't the bad ones. They're just new to the culture of the sci-fi fandom, and it's the rabbit puppies that need to be dealt with. And this idea that Vox Day, the guy who runs the rabbit puppies campaign, is horrible and awful, and he needs to be banned from the Hugos and run out of the fandom, it completely baffles me. When people criticize Vox Day, it's never about the quality of the books he writes. You know, the thing that actually matters when it comes to science fiction writing. No, it's always about his character and beliefs. And sure, you can criticize his character, but there are other authors in the Science Fiction Writers of America whose behavior is just as bad, if not worse. People have called him a white supremacist, but he's promoted Haruki Murakami, among other non-white authors on his blog, something that'd be a big no-no among actual white supremacists. It seems to me that the real issue that so many people have with Vox Day is that they disagree with his political views. Because, you know, the idea that women should get degrees in STEM fields is just horrible. How dare he say that? Some people had such a big problem with the sad puppies and the rabid puppies that they organized an anti-voting slate, something that previous critics of award begging from before the rabid puppies did not do. Because, you know, it's assumed that readers of science fiction have the ability to think for themselves like intelligent adults and vote for the works that they think are most deserving of an award based on the quality of the work. Now, there was an accusation that certain people were stuffing the ballot box with votes going along with that anti-puppy slate. 
and we can confirm that that is entirely within the realm of possibility given the current Worldcon rules. See, last year, some authors got together to buy Worldcon supporting memberships for 100 of their readers, and that supporting membership is what entitles you to a vote. That proves that one could basically purchase multiple votes for the Hugo Award if you had enough money. So let's say a group of friends had 2,000 active Twitter followers, which is a paltry amount for users of that service. They had $40,000 between them and zero cents. Then they could easily buy some no awards while giving away a bunch of free eBooks. Granted, we might never know for sure what actually happened, but we must consider this possibility as open-minded individuals. Now we've seen some excuses in favor of the use of Hugo nomination slates, but their arguments weren't very strong. Mary Robinette Cowell said that what we're seeing with the Hugo Awards is that readers and writers who have not been represented in science fiction and fantasy, women, people of color, LGBT, are becoming prominent because of a larger zeitgeist that is trying to redress historic imbalances. There are plenty of excuses that we've heard for this new brand of affirmative action in writing, but the only good one is that it makes for a better work, that there are good stories that you'd be missing out on if you only read the work of straight white males. Besides, no one who's sane actually gives a shit about the author's skin tone. They just want to know if the content of the book is any good. And beyond all that, I don't understand where this notion of historical imbalances came from. Have the people who continue to perpetuate this notion actually read the works that were published before they were born? Do they not know that Frankenstein, one of the earliest science fiction novels, was written by a woman named Mary Shelley? Or what about all the sci-fi novels written outside of the US? From The Legend of Galactic Heroes by Yoshiki Tanaka, to the many books published by Hikasoru, an imprint of Viz Media. Besides, Leigh Brackett already showed during an interview back in 1976 that there never really was any pushback against women writing science fiction. She said the only time she got any complaints was early on in her career, when her writing wasn't as good. And this isn't some no-name author who only got a couple of stories published. This is Leigh Brackett, one of the co-writers of the best Star Wars film ever made. And no, her early draft of the script was not discarded, like many bloggers would have you believe. Her script has been available online for over half a decade now, so anyone could easily compare it with the finished work. It's almost as if this notion that only straight white males have been successful in the field of science fiction was crafted specifically to push works of lesser quality on readers. But that would be crazy. Although that does remind me of a certain article on a video game blog, Kotaku, about that very subject matter. Yes, in Straight White Male, the lowest difficulty setting there is, John Scalzi argued that people who are straight white men are on an easier difficulty setting than anyone else in life. But that's just one view. Another is the easiest difficulty is really granted through wealth, particularly wealth that is inherited from one's parents. And all these other aspects pale in comparison to that one. In a follow-up post, Scalzi actually addresses that argument where he says that things like race, gender, and sexuality are inherent traits, while Scalzi himself has, quote, been both at the bottom and the top of the wealth and class spectrum here in the US. <coughs> because, you know, no one's ever used a pen name or a disguise to hide their true identity, and medical technology certainly hasn't gotten to the point where someone with vast amounts of wealth can change the color or shape of their body. That just wouldn't happen. But we're getting way off topic here. As for the Hugo Awards, it's obvious that unless they find a way to adapt to the advent of the internet, then they're only going to be relevant in matters of internet flame wars. I mean, sure, there's the E Pluribus Hugo rule change, but that won't actually stop bloggers from getting their readers to nominate poor quality books for the ballot. It just means that we'll have works from five different Hugo slates instead of one or two. Now, I've heard some talk that maybe the Dragon Con Awards could be a suitable replacement for the Hugos, but from what I've seen of their site, they would be even easier to game than the Hugos, and far cheaper as well. All one would need is a VPN, a few hundred sock puppet email accounts, and way too much free time. And unlike the Hugo Awards, you wouldn't even need an insane amount of disposable income to game it either. But then, awards are not the be-all end-all for readers who want to find good science fiction to read. There are plenty of other avenues for finding the best stories in the field. And no, I'm not talking about top 10 lists written by clickbait bloggers, many of whom are just trying to sell you books written by their friends. 
No, what I suggest is that we, as fans of science fiction stories, be the ones to bring attention to quality works in the genre ourselves. Users of 4chan's literature board have already made a few charts filled with some of the best works of science fiction, and there's no reason why we can't make similar recommendations, since it's obvious we can't trust for-profit sites to do it honestly. And if we aren't seeing stories that meet the standards of excellence set by works that have come before, then we should be writing them ourselves. There's a wealth of science fiction stories from the past several decades that many writers ignore that we could take inspiration from. If we don't write and promote the greatest that the genre of science fiction has to offer, then we have only ourselves to blame when lesser works get promoted as the best that we can do.